All amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News Update. We'll have a look at some of the main stories that have caught my attention in the press recently, and we'll also take a look at some of the comments that you guys have left on the channel in recent times. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that have supported the channel in recent times, whether it's through the Super Chat option on YouTube, buying me a coffee, Patreon supporters, or the new way to support the channel on YouTube, the YouTube membership option. Thank you very much for that. Now, straight into the news, and it's full steam ahead for the amnesty for Catalan separatist politicians that tried to separate from Spain back in 2017. And yes, Today, the Spanish government and its partners came to an agreement to change the way that terrorism can be interpreted by the Spanish justice system. And as we can read here, the PSOE creates the concept of light terrorism to fit Puigdemont's need. The final version of the amnesty law will have two types of terrorism and will pardon what is considered as light terrorism. This category is important to Junts and ERC because it includes the only two terrorism-related cases connected to the Catalan independence process those involving the CDR, Committee for the Defense of the Republic, and the Tsunami Democratic. The PSOE and the independentist groups agreed on this yesterday in a joint amendment. This amendment aims to ensure amnesty for all those accused of terrorism. The list includes 24 people, 12 from the CDR who have already been formally charged with terrorism, and 12 from Tsunami, including the former president, Carlos Puigdemont, and the ERC leader, Marta Rovira. So there we go changes, some important changes to the way that the word terrorism can be understood by the Spanish justice system. As we know, Spain has had an issue with terrorism over the years. Now they have come up with the concept of light terrorism to protect people like Carles Puigdemont so they don't end up in prison on terrorism charges when they come back to Spain. And I haven't seen a government do an about turn like the one that is currently happening in Spain for a long, long time. The PSOE coalition government bending over backwards to satisfy the needs of Mr. Puigdemont. For the justice system here in Spain, Mr. Puigdemont is a criminal, and that's what the government wants to change. Basically, they're taking power away from the courts and justice system in this country so that people like Mr. Puigdemont can never be prosecuted. And for many people in the legal profession here, the country is heading down a slippery slope, and everything playing into the hands of these separatist politicians so that they can hold another referendum further down the track. That's where we're heading. Now, the second piece of news today related to driving cars and pollution in Spanish cities. Anyone who's been to a big city here would have realized that they can get a little bit polluted at times, and the government and its traffic directorate is trying to change this by getting old cars off the road. However, the plan is not coming along as fast as they would like. And as we can see here, driving pollution map, one third of Spanish vehicles still pollute too much. It has been almost eight years since the Dirección General de Tráfico, DGT, introduced the classification of environmental stickers in Spain. A system of four stickers based on the impact of vehicles on the environment was developed taking into account the most efficient 50% of the vehicle fleet. Almost a decade later, the most polluting half has been reduced to only a third of the total, according to the vehicle census to which Datos RTVE has had access. But the aging of vehicles, especially those with a B label, is still a drag on the goal of reducing harmful emissions from road traffic. So there we go, almost eight years since the traffic department here in Spain introduced those environmental stickers. As we know, we have type B sticker, type C sticker, an eco sticker, and of course a zero sticker for cars with zero emissions, for example, electric vehicles. But it's cars with a B sticker, mainly diesel cars, I believe, that are still a drag on reducing those harmful emissions, as we saw in that article there. So no doubt heavier restrictions will come into force in coming years to try to get cars with B stickers off the roads altogether, especially in cities. Keeping on the subject of cars, and it's good news for car dealerships that sell Chinese cars because sales are up apparently. 
As we can read here, Chinese car makers tripled their car sales in Spain in 2023. The composition of the Spanish car market is changing with the arrival of new brands, mainly from Asia. Until a few years ago, the top sales positions were held by Seat, Renault and Citroën, while Toyota and Kia have been the best-selling brands in Spain for two consecutive years. This new order is not likely to remain unchanged for long either, as Chinese brands have set their sights on the Spanish market, and it is likely that in a few years we will see some of these brands in the top commercial positions. In just three years, the firms coming out of the Asian giant have gone from having a testimonial position in the Spanish market of less than 1% to quadrupling their presence since at the end of 2023 they had a 4% share in Spain, well above the 1.4% recorded the previous year. So Chinese cars in Spain becoming more and more popular in recent years, going from around 1% of the total fleet a few years ago to 4% of the total fleet in 2023. Now I will say, after observing the types of cars on Spanish highways, every time I'm out and about having a drive, I take a look at the cars around me, and I have noticed that there are a lot more MGs and BYDs, build your dreams cars, I think the brand is, on the roads here in Spain nowadays. And if the trend continues, there's going to be a lot more in coming years. And the final piece of news we'll look at today about Spanish tennis champion Rafa Nadal. Currently dividing opinion here in Spain is Mr. Nadal and around the world too because of a deal that he has done with Saudi Arabia to become the ambassador of of Saudi Arabian tennis. And the latest piece of news about Mr. Nadal is that he is investing some of that Saudi earned money in Madrid in the hotel market. Because as we can see here, Nadal and hotel chain Melia to open a hotel on the Gran Via to compete with Cristiano Ronaldo. The hotel alliance between tennis player Rafael Nadal and Melia will open a new hotel on Gran Via just a few steps away from the hotel owned by Cristiano Ronaldo. Zell, the brand that Melia launched last year together with the tennis player Rafa Nadal is preparing for new openings next year. According to the CEO and president of Melia, Gabriel Escared, one of the openings will be in Gran Via. Specifically, the new Zell de Gran Via in Madrid will be located in one of the hotels currently managed by the Mallorcan chain in this central artery and will compete with the Pestana CR7 Gran Via hotel owned by sportsman Cristiano Ronaldo. So there we go, Rafa Nadal team up with hotel chain Melia and opening a hotel on the Gran Via. Surprisingly, not far from football player Cristiano Ronaldo's hotel, who is also raking in those Saudi dollars currently. So good luck, Rafa, and I hope your investment in a hotel on Madrid's main artery, the Gran Via, goes well. Now let's take a look at some comments that have been left on videos recently. One here from Michael Stu, great stuff as usual. Regarding taking big money deals from the Saudis, I don't think you ever mentioned the world-class Spanish golfer John Ram from Barrica in the Basque Country. He recently sold his soul for upwards of $400 million to the rebel golf breakaway organization Live Golf after vowing never to leave the PGA. It seems everyone does have a price, but just how much do people really need? in my humble opinion. And a similar comment from Blu-ray, does he not have enough money already? When is enough enough? Yeah, Michael and Blu-ray, thanks for the comments. And there is a common theme in both of those comments asking the question, when is enough money enough? When do you say, no, I don't need any more money? The case of Nadal and also the other person mentioned there, John Rahm, who apparently said that he would never go to live golf, but he did for $400 million, apparently, as pointed out there by Michael in that comment, obviously chasing the big bucks and making it clear for all to see that you can never have enough. The more you get, the greedier you become. And of course, this is not limited to sports people. It's a common business practice also, because we could easily throw in names like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk in there instead of Rafa Nadal and John Ram. But it's the system and society that we live in, and people like John Ram and Rafa Nadal will no doubt justify their decisions by saying that if I don't take it, somebody else will. So better in my pocket than in somebody else's. One here from Burnett. Hi Stuart, do you know what is happening with the price of olive oil? Last year we paid direct from Farmer, 5 litres was costing between 22 and 28 euros, this year it's 50 to 60 euros, and even at the supermarket we paid 4 euros last year, now 10 euros 25 this year. Just wondering what your listeners think. Yeah Mary, thanks for the comment, and this is a topic that has popped up on the channel numerous times 
countries over the last year or so, ever since olive oil prices began to rise. As you said, not long ago, we were paying around €4.25 for a litre of premium olive oil, extra virgin olive oil that is, and now the price for the same product is over €10 a litre. And unfortunately, no one seems to know where the price limit is going to be when it comes to olive oil here in Spain. Apparently, one of the reasons for the high prices is the weather conditions that have affected the olive crops in Andalusia in recent times. Farmers was not able apparently to pick enough olives, produce enough olive oil, leading to a shortage, hence the high prices. And from what I've heard, the situation is not going to get better anytime soon. And another interesting fact is that theft of olive oil from supermarkets is at an all-time high also. So if you are a user of olive oil like Mary is and I am, we're just going to have to get used to high prices for the time being, unfortunately. One here from Marco, fully agree with Keisha Bank comment, most atrocious bank I was ever with. Unexplained charges, centralised inefficient decision making. I had to take them to court for illegal mortgage fees. No apology when they lost. ETC ETC. Yeah Marco, thanks for the comment and adding to the debate about Spanish banks that we have been having on the channel in recent times. Somebody mentioned the word Caixa Bank the other day and somebody in the comment section said that they are the worst bank in Spain. And Marco, obviously for various reasons that he puts forward in his comment agreeing with that that person. Now I am a customer of that bank, Caixa Bank here in Spain, and to be honest with you guys, I've never had a problem, or at least a serious problem like the ones put forward there. But as I said yesterday in the live stream, banking here in Spain can be a little bit hit and miss. Sometimes you get a good bank, sometimes you get a bad bank, sometimes you get a good bank manager, sometimes you get a bad bank manager. As I said, hit and miss. But let me know your thoughts on what are the good banks and what are the bad banks here in Spain in the comment section below. I'd love to hear them. One here from Diego, as we have not enough problems and challenges in Spain, our government enjoys wasting time and our money in stupid issues nobody cares about. Last example, Urte Sun, Minister of Culture, trying to review Spanish history and decolonize museums. Some lessons to this guy, surprisingly, Minister of Culture. One, leave history to historians who don't fall in out of context judgments and don't have a political agenda. Two, Spain did not have colonies. The territories were integrated as Spanish provinces, as Spanish as Cáceres, Sevilla, etc., similar to how the Romans did with their empire. Yeah, Diego, thanks for the comment, and fairly clear that you are not happy with some of the comments made by Spain's new culture minister, who's only been in the job for a few months, as we know. And the other day, he announced a review of Spanish museums and Spanish cultural heritage in order to reassess the cultural framing of these assets, what Whatever that means. And maybe you're right, politicians should leave history to the historians. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Is this something that Spain should be reviewing, or are there more important things? on the agenda. Let me know what you think. One here from Annabel El Greco, the Greek, was born around 1541 in Crete, which was then part of the Republic of Venice. In his mid-twenties, he travelled to Venice and studied under Titian, who was the most renowned painter of his day. Around age 35, he moved to Toledo, Spain, where he lived and worked for the rest of his life, producing his best-known paintings. Yeah, Annabel, thanks for the comment, and as you mentioned there, El Greco, or the Greek, one of the most renowned painters in Spain. Spanish history, even though he wasn't born in Spain. And will some of this person's paintings come under review from the new culture minister here in Spain? Most likely. And I think a lot of the other works of art that are in places like the Prado Museum in Madrid will also come under scrutiny. So it'll be interesting to see how the government goes about re-educating people on how they view these classic works of art. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the video out as you normally do. If you have an opinion on any of the topics that I have spoken about today, the comment section is the place for you. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.